From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Mexico, and I respect Mexico, I respect their leaders. What they've done to us is incredible. Their leaders are so much smarter, so much sharper, and it's incredible. In fact, that could be a Mexican plane up there. They're getting ready to attack. From joking about Mexico attacking the United States to tweeting an anti-Semitic image showing Hillary Clinton against a backdrop of cash and a star of David, Republican presumptive nominee Donald Trump is facing a new wave of controversies. We spend the hour with investigative journalist Wayne Barrett, who's been covering Trump for over 40 years. I think he represents not just a danger to America, but because we are such an influence in the world. It's really a shocking threat to the world. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm in a sick bed a lot, but he gets me up out of it. We'll hear how Donald Trump learned at the knee of Joe McCarthy's former aide, attorney Roy Cohen, as well as how Trump once tried to bribe Wayne Barrett with an apartment. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Across the world, people are mourning a string of attacks that have killed hundreds of people in Iraq, Bangladesh and Saudi Arabia during the final days of the holy month of Ramadan. The deadliest attack occurred in Baghdad early Sunday morning. More than 200 people were killed when a suicide truck bomb exploded in a busy shopping district. It was one of the deadliest attacks in Iraq since the 2003 U.S. invasion. ISIS has claimed responsibility. Many of the victims were children and families that had gathered to shop for new clothes for this week's Eid al-Fitr celebration, which marks the end of Ramadan. On Sunday, a local resident decried the bombing. Is this Eid? Every Eid we celebrate. Is this our Eid? Is this our Eid? Is this our Eid that everybody celebrates? Is this the Eid we should celebrate? People came to buy clothes to celebrate Eid. Now they are buying coffins. They're buying coffins. May God punish those who are responsible. More than two days after the attacks, the death toll continues to rise as more and more bodies are discovered in the rubble. Today, Major General Khadim Saban spoke about the recovery effort. We are still searching for dead bodies. Today, we were able to exhume remains, and we will continue searching for human remains at the scene. We found documents and mobiles belonging to the victims. Sunday's bombing in Baghdad came only two days after militants seized control of a trendy restaurant in Dhaka, Bangladesh, taking dozens hostage and ultimately killing 22 people. On Friday, a half-dozen attackers stormed the Holy Artisan Bakery in the diplomatic district of the capital, wielding explosives, guns and swords. In the ensuing 11-hour siege, the militants killed 20 diners from around the world, including nine Italians, seven Japanese, one Indian, two Bangladeshis and one U.S. citizen. Two police officers were later killed when the authorities raided the restaurant and killed five of the six attackers. Authorities say the six attackers were all young men from Bangladesh's elite who attended the country's top schools. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the attack, although Bangladeshi officials say the men were part of local militant groups. On Monday, hundreds gathered in Dhaka to honor the victims. We have gathered here today in grief in anger, in solidarity, in protest of the gruesome killings of innocent people who had just gone to have dinner. This kind of an attack in a public place with innocent civilians, many of whom were our guests in our country, is something that is unacceptable to all people of this country. Meanwhile, Monday, militants carried out three separate suicide bomb attacks across Saudi Arabia, including an attack in the holy city of Medina that killed four security officers near the mosque where the Prophet Muhammad is believed to be buried. The mosque is one of the holiest sites for Muslims worldwide.
Another separate attack near the U.S. consulate in the Saudi city of Jeddah wounded two security officers. No one has yet claimed responsibility for today's attacks. The string of deadly attacks comes only days after militants attacked the main airport in Istanbul, Turkey, on Tuesday, killing 42 people. The airport is the 11th busiest in the world. In news from the campaign trail, President Obama and Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton are slated to hold their first joint campaign event today in Charlotte, North Carolina. The presumptive Republican presidential nominee, Donald Trump, is also expected to hold a campaign rally in North Carolina today. Clinton's first campaign appearance with Obama comes after the FBI interviewed Clinton on Saturday as part of its investigation into her use of a private email server while she was secretary of state. Unnamed sources told CNN the FBI is not expected to bring charges against Clinton. This comes in the midst of continued controversy over a meeting on the tarmac of a Phoenix airport between Attorney General Loretta Lynch and former President Bill Clinton last week. Republicans say the meeting compromises the Justice Department investigation into Clinton's email use. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's facing criticism after he tweeted an image on Saturday showing Hillary Clinton a pile of $100 bills and a six-pointed Star of David, along with the words, quote, most corrupt candidate ever. The tweet immediately drew criticism for being anti-Semitic. Trump has called the claims of anti-Semitism ridiculous, but he deleted the tweet and later retweeted the same image, but with the Star of David replaced by a circle. The news outlet Mike.com has reported the original image shared by Donald Trump came from a Twitter user whose feed includes a number of violent and offensive images of African Americans, Muslims and immigrants. This comes as the Council on American-Islamic Relations is warning, quote, American Muslims, and particularly Muslim women, are facing an unprecedented spike in discrimination and hate attacks, due in no small part to Donald Trump's Islamophobic rhetoric and policy proposals, unquote. This comes after Donald Trump's comments during a town hall in New Hampshire on Thursday. This is the question followed by Trump's answer. Just to mix quickly, um, homeland security and jobs. Why aren't we putting our retiree, our military retirees on that border or in TSA? Get rid of all these heebie jobbies they wear at TSA. Well, I, I've seen I, them yeah, myself. I, I understand. We need that. the veterans back yeah. in there to take it. They've fought for this country and defended it. They'll still do it. Okay. Thank you. You know, and we are looking at that. And we are looking at that. We're looking at a lot of things. Meanwhile, police are investigating at least two attacks against Muslims over the weekend. In Houston, Texas, a Muslim doctor was ambushed, stabbed and shot multiple times by three men as he was on his way to a mosque for morning prayer on Sunday. He has survived. This came one day after a man in Florida was beaten outside a mosque in Fort Pierce on his way to morning prayers. The Florida branch of CARE says the attacker said, quote, you Muslims need to get back to your country, he said. Meanwhile, in Ohio, Avon Mayor Brian Jensen has apologized after police handcuffed and pinned an Emirati tourist to the ground outside his hotel after a hotel worker called 911, alleging the man had pledged his allegiance to ISIS. In fact, the man was simply standing outside the hotel in a formal white robe, speaking on his cell phone in Arabic. The police pointed their guns at him, then pinned him down on the ground before realizing he was unarmed. The man later collapsed and had to be hospitalized. The Obama administration has released its internal assessment of the number of civilians killed by drone strikes in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia and Libya. The long-awaited reported claims between 64 and 116 civilians have been killed since President Obama took office. However, reporters, researchers and monitoring groups estimate the death toll from drone-related killings is as much as 10 times higher than this estimate. Even former drone operators disputed the Obama administration's estimates. Brandon Bryant, who worked worked on Air Force drone teams from 2006 to 2011, told The New York Times the civilian death toll was significantly higher, saying officials were, quote, just deluding themselves about the impact, unquote. In Toronto, Canada, Black Lives Matter activists shut down Canada's largest pride parade Sunday, demanding event organizers ban police floats at the parade and commit to hiring more black, trans and indigenous people for future pride events. After successfully stopping the parade for about a half hour, the pride director met with the activists and agreed to their demands. 
And writer, Holocaust survivor, Nobel Peace Prize winner Elie Wiesel has died. The author of several dozen books, he testified to the horrors of the Holocaust. He was born September 30, 1928, in Romania. When the Nazis invaded, he and his family were deported to Auschwitz, which became the subject of his most famous book, Night. He went on to be an outspoken human rights activist on many issues, although generated great controversy in the human rights community by denying Israel's role in the mass expulsion and continued oppression of Palestinians. In 1986, Wiesel was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. This is a part of his acceptance speech. I know that as long as one dissident is in prison, our freedom will not be true. As long as one child is hungry, our lives will be filled with anguish and shame, for I have seen children hungry. But all these victims need, above all, is to know that they are not alone, that we are not forgetting them. Elie Wiesel died at his home in Manhattan on Saturday, at the age of 87. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. With the Republican National Convention opening in Cleveland in less than two weeks, the party's presumptive presidential nominee, Donald Trump, is facing a new round of controversies. On Saturday, his campaign tweeted an image showing Hillary Clinton, a pile of $100 bills and six-pointed stars shaped like the Star of David, along with the world's most corrupt candidate ever. The tweet immediately drew criticism for being anti-Semitic. Trump later deleted the tweet, then retweeted the same image, but with the star replaced by a circle. The original image, shared by the presumptive Republican presidential candidate, came from a Twitter user whose feed includes a number of violent and offensive images of African American Americans, Muslims and immigrants. This comes as the Council on American Islamic Relations is warning Donald Trump's comments are putting Muslim women in danger after his comments last week at a town hall when he was questioned by a supporter about Muslims working for the TSA. Just to mix quickly, um, homeland security and jobs. Why aren't we putting our retiree, our military retirees on that border or in TSA? Get rid of all these heebie jobbies they wear at TSA. Well, I, I've I, seen them yeah, myself. I, I understand. We need that. the veterans back yeah. in there to take it. They've fought for this country and defended it. They'll still do it. Okay. Thank you. You know, and we are looking at that. And we are looking at that. We're looking at a lot of things. At that same town hall in New Hampshire, Donald Trump joked about Mexico attacking the United States. Mexico, and I respect Mexico, I respect their leaders. What they've done to us is incredible. Their leaders are so much smarter, so much sharper, and it's incredible. In fact, that could be a Mexican plane up there. They're getting ready to attack. We turn now to part two of our in-depth look at Donald Trump. Last week, Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez and I visited Wayne Barrett, considered the preeminent journalist on Donald Trump. He's been tracking Trump for decades. His 1991 biography of Donald Trump was just republished as an ebook with the title Trump, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Deals, The Downfall, The Reinvention. On Thursday, we aired part one of the interview. Today, we bring you part two for the hour. We visited Wayne Barrett at his home. He talked about Trump's longtime lawyer and mentor, Roy Cohen, who once served as a top aide to the red-baiting senator, Joseph McCarthy. I knew Roy Cohen. I knew him very well. And you just cannot understand how Donald could have been this close. I write in the book that they talked 15 times a day. One of the two stories here, I can't remember which one said it was five times a day. I, it's probably somewhere in between. Roy himself told me they talked 15 times a day. But uh, uh, there's no question that next to Fred Trump, Roy Cohn was the single greatest influence in Donald's life. A and Roy is incandescent evil. I mean, I would sit with him and, I, you know, it, it was enough to make you rush back to church, the satanic feeling that he would give you. He would eat with his fingers. We would be at 21. He would eat with his fingers. He would. Uh, he carried a little glass in his uh, in his jacket that he would take out and drink in this little glass. He would pop a white pill when he didn't think you were 
were looking, and he, his house was filled with frogs. He was the weirdest guy. He was into the strangest stuff. He was a chicken hawk after little boys, and yet he was the most virulently anti-gay guy you could imagine. And uh, so that was Donald's mentor and constant sidekick, who right. represented all five of the organized crime families in the city of New York. For young people who don't know Roy Cohen's background back to McCarthy, can yeah. you explain who he is and what it meant for Donald Trump to learn at his knee? Yeah, well, he starts out as, I think he was 23 years old when he was the chief counsel to Joe McCarthy doing all those hearings. He was extremely wired into the Reagan White House. He helped make Donald Trump's sister, Marianne, a federal judge in 1983. He was the ultimate fixer power player in New York for a whole period of time. He died of AIDS in, the, in 1986, but for a, a particular block of time, he was extremely influential with the Beam administration because even more so than Fred Trump, he was totally wired into Abe Beam because uh, he had knocked Mario Biaggi out of the race. Mario Biaggi was a very popular, charismatic congressman from the Bronx, and Roy leaked that he had uh, been before a federal grand jury, and initially Biaggi denied it, and ultimately it was established that he had been, and that's why he couldn't run, and that was Roy getting Biagi out of the race for Beam. So Beam was incredibly beholden to him. So he had enormous influence uh, in, in the city underground. I would write stories about his parking lots. Strangely enough, his cash cow was city-owned parking lots by the water, which were released by the Bureau of Marine and Aviation and he controlled the companies that had the parking lots that were city-owned. And it was just an enormous amount of money. He never paid any taxes. He pretended to have no income. He had an incredible cash uh, empire. And the guy who actually leased those parking lots to him, Rick Mazio, wound up under federal investigation, and they found his body in the trunk of a car. And he, all he did was give parking lots to Roy Cohn. That's what he did for a living. Uh, and so you just look at the, as I said, the, you know, he was the middleman between Donald and all these mob guys. You asked about the apartments at Trump Tower. John Cody gets an apartment at Trump Tower. Uh, John Cody is a Gambino crime family associate uh, who I had lunch with while I was doing the book. I had lunch with him at Windows on the World. <laughs> and, uh, and top of the World Trade Center. Yes, and it must have been under, uh, under federal surveillance because two weeks after the lunch, they busted him for trying to kill the guy, who, Bobby Sasso, who had taken over Local 282, which was his union that was the concrete delivery men. They delivered all the concrete to all the sites in New York, totally mob-controlled. And so they, they busted him for trying to kill the guy. He, he had already been in jail. He goes back to jail. Well, he had a—he uh, denied it was a mistress, but he certainly told me that we, they were very close. Verena Hickson, I talk about her in the book, she got not only an apartment in Trump Tower, it's the only apartment with a pool. It's right underneath Donald's apartment, right? And all of it built for John Cody, because— Trump Tower is a total concrete structure. It was the first concrete structure like that built in New York. So John Cody had complete control over this. Uh, and uh, so he gets this apartment. He actually invested in the apartment himself, as I established in the book. And uh, Verena Hickson is there, who I met with a few times. He, she used to meet me in Central Park. She didn't want to meet me in Trump Tower, but we talked many times, and, uh, uh, you know, and there's John hanging out in Trump Tower all the time, right underneath Donald Trump's apartment. And he's a, he's a total wise guy. 
he's, he's a total wise guy. And, you know, he, he said a mob, to me. A mob guy. Yeah, he said to me, oh, I always used Roy as the go-between with Donald. Don, Roy was the guy who, Roy Cohn was the guy who set us up. You know, so this is the relationships that flowed through. The, you know, the FBI did an affidavit saying that the heads of the commission, the heads of the five crime families, would meet in Roy Cohn's office because the government couldn't eavesdrop. It was a lawyer-client relationship. That's what they did. And you're talking here about the five families uh, in New York, but, of course, Donald Trump's uh, signature uh, developments occurred uh, in Atlantic City, uh, where, as I recall, the Philadelphia mob was in charge of whatever happened in Atlantic City. Did you talk about his relationship there in Atlantic City? Yeah, well, no question. I mean, Nikki Scarfo, Nikki Scarfo. Uh, Nikki Scarfo, that's the bloodiest crime family in the history of the United States. It's undervalued because it wasn't based in New York. It didn't get the coverage, you know. But they controlled Local 54, which was the hotel workers union. And this is not me talking. This is a finding in federal court that uh, Nikki Scarfo controlled the hotel workers union. And when they would strike all the casinos in Atlantic City, they wouldn't strike Donald. You know, when he first goes down there, into Atlantic City to acquire his first parcels. He buys them at a premium, overpays from underbosses of the Nico Scar Nicky Scarfo crime family. He has a relationship with these guys throughout the early days of, of his time down there. And uh, it, it's, uh, it was really a pretty remarkable set of deals that he did. Now, you had uh, one, Mike Matthews was the, gov the mayor of Atlantic City, who was totally proven in court, went to jail, totally owned by the Nicky Scarfo crime family, and he was Donald's number one ally. They were feeding him money, contributions, legal contributions, but they were feeding Matthews money. And that's just one part of this intricate relationship that gave birth to Donald's casino empire. In, in Atlantic City. Can you talk about this casino empire and what it meant? You actually, unlike most people in this country, got to see Donald Trump's tax records? Yeah, I did. I did. How did you get to? Well, they were, they were part of the record of the Casino Control Commission uh, in the 70s. He would have to submit his uh, tax returns for the first casino that he did down there, at least. Trump Plaza. I mean, one of the great ironies is that his second casino, Trump Castle, uh, was actually built by the Hiltons. And the Hilton family out of Chicago was denied a license by the Casino Control Commission, which was all done to benefit Donald. Donald then gets Trump Castle. And the rationale for denying it, which is what they stated in their decision, was that he was, that the Hilton family was represented by a mob lawyer out of, uh, out of Chicago. And here he's got Roy Cohn, and that's no bar at all. That's no bar at all. And so the irony of it, that's how he got his second casino. Um, and so the casino empire there, what's so interesting to me is, you know, when we had the Nevada primary, he was always at the Trump Hotel down in, 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 in Las Vegas. But that's only a hotel. You know, there's no casino there, right? Why is there no casino there? His partner in it, Phil Ruffin, already owns a different casino, so he can qualify for a license. But they build a hotel without a casino in the heart of Las Vegas. Because, I mean, my only conclusion is that he couldn't get a license in Nevada. The guy might be president of the United States, but here they have this hotel without a casino in the heart of Vegas, right? I mean, I had, when the, my book came out, I started getting visited by these state troopers from Missouri because he had applied for a riverboat casino license in Missouri. And these guys were so thorough. They came and they met me in my house in Ocean City, New Jersey. We call it the house Trump bought with the book advance, you know. And 
Then they would meet me in my house and the, at the village, I mean, my office at the village voice. They'd go through all my, they were, they came back and forth. They denied him. They were about to deny him, I should say, a riverboat license in Missouri. You realize he's not gotten a casino license since he got one for the Taj. He had the DGE, the Division of Gaming Enforcement, and the Casino Control Commission in New Jersey fixed. He had a, it was rigged for Donald. I don't, I don't think there's any question in my mind about that. And, and what wouldn't be? It's a, it's a company town. The only thing in it is casinos. He owned four of them. He was only illegally allowed to own three of them. So when he bought the fourth one, that just became a hotel. And, you know, they closed down the casino in it and just ran it as a hotel. But to me, there's, there's no other explanation that I can find as to why he does not have a casino in his hotel in Las Vegas, other than he couldn't go through the licensing procedure. He was given in 2004 some kind of a clearance by the casino regulators there of suitability. But that's just a preliminary step. If you're actually going to get a license, you've got to go through an intensive background. And he withdrew before he was going to be denied in Missouri, and he's never applied for a license in Nevada, where he has a giant hotel. It's kind of ironic to me that a guy who wants to be president of the United States is afraid to go through a gaming commission licensing procedure. Wayne Barrett, Donald Trump offered you an apartment, the man who's dogged him for decades? Well, that was very early. I hadn't started dogging him yet. That was to induce me not to dog him. When I started out uh, on the trail of the Hyatt, I f uh, filed a freedom of information request with both the state and the city. And I was at the state Urban Development Corporation offices um, reading all the files, which was a table full of documents related to the Hyatt. And I was alone in a conference room, and uh, the phone starts ringing in the conference room. I don't know whether to pick up or, or not. I finally pick up, Wayne, this is Donald. I understand you're going to write a story about me. I never met the guy in my life at that point. It was like we were old friends. And uh, so I met with him early in the reporting process. I always use this with journalism students uh, as an example of what not to do. If you're circling, uh, circling a subject, you don't want to you know, go face to face with them because you never know whether you're going to get a second shot. You, you don't want to go face to face with him until you've got all of your ducks in a row. But because he interrupted very early the reporting process, I met with him before I really had many of the ducks in a row, and I could only ask softball questions. He loved me then, you know. I, you know, it was you know, Ivana was walking around the apartment. It was on a Saturday uh, or a Sunday. I know it was weekend. And Ivana's walking around the apartment. It's on Fifth Avenue, but it's long before Trump Tower. And, you know, so in the midst of that, I had not told him that I lived in Ocean Hill Brownsville, which was then the poorest community in the city of New York. It would be unfathomable to him that I lived there by choice because I, I wanted to live there. So he, he said to me, Wayne, you don't have to live in Brownsville. I have plenty of apartments. And uh, so then at another time, I, it was not at that first interview, but some sometime subsequent to that, he started talking to me about how he had broken this other journalist by suing him and driving him into bankruptcy. So it was the carrot and the stick, and they were both jokes. Wayne Barrett, investigative reporter who worked with The Village Voice for 37 years. Wayne's 1991 biography of Trump has just been republished as an e-book. The title, Trump, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Deals, The Downfall, The Reinvention. We'll be back with him in a minute. I gonna tell you fascists, you may hate me surprised. People in this world are got to organize your vows to lose, your fascist vows to lose. All of your 
fascist bound to lose. I said, all of your fascist bound to lose. Yes, sir. All of your fascist bound to lose. You're bound to lose. Your fascist bound to lose. People of every country march from side to side, march and cross these fields where a million fascists died. You're bound to lose. Your fascists bound to lose. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our look at Donald Trump, about a thousand housekeepers, cooks, bellmen, and others at Trump's Taj Mahal Atlantic City Casino went on strike Friday and through the weekend, demanding reinstatement, reinstatement of health, pension, and other benefits eliminated during one of Trump's bankruptcy proceedings. We return now to our conversation with Wayne Barrett, considered the preeminent journalist on Donald Trump. Wayne Barrett has been tracking Trump for decades. His 1991 biography just republished as an e-book. It's titled Trump, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Deals, The Downfall, The Reinvention. Juan Gonzalez and I spoke to Wayne Barrett at his home, where he's largely been confined due to his battle with lung cancer. We asked Wayne Barrett about Donald Trump's unkept promise to build affordable housing in Atlantic City in order to build larger projects. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's one of the undercovered parts of the Atlantic City story. And I actually think that The Times and The Washington Post have done excellent stories on his—and uh, political, on his um, Atlantic City uh, debacle, really. But he made a commitment in Atlantic City. And, and you remember Tony Glideman. Tony Glideman was the city's housing commissioner who went to work for Donald. And housing was his specialty. And Glideman helped negotiate these agreements with Atlantic City. Four out of five of the mayors went to jail during the period that Donald was dominant there. And he had incredible relationships with most of them. And um, But he signed these agreements because he was getting city-owned property near the Taj. He was getting all kinds of agreements from the city uh, regarding roadways and access to Trump Castle, which is out at the marina. It's not on the boardwalk. And so for these favors from city government, he agreed to build low-income housing. And he had the guy to do it. He had the guy who'd done it in New York. And they made all kinds of commitments that were written right into agreements with the, with the city of Atlantic City. And then he failed on all of them. I mean, you know, people don't realize it. But, you know, you drive into Atlantic City, you can go right into Trump Plaza is right off of the highway. It's really the best site in Atlantic City. You can drive right into the garage. You walk out of the garage, they have this moving uh, platform that'll carry you right into the casino. Now, it doesn't exist anymore, but I'm talking about when it did. And then there's no windows. So you don't even have to look out at this poverty that's just cataclysmic. And it's right outside the window. It's like an alternative universe located right within a city that's decimated, that's desolate, right? and with so poverty-stricken. And, and uh, he never built any of the units, and he leaves town from being the king of Atlantic City. He's a guy who now laughs about how he got out and, you know, with all of his cash flow, got out just in time. I want to ask you about a subject that's been raised quite a bit uh, during the campaign, even by some of the uh, top Republican leaders, Mitt Romney for one, Donald Trump's tax returns. Why do you think he's resisting so much uh, being able to make his tax returns public? I, uh... I don't think we have to speculate about it. And the reason I say that is Tim O'Brien, who was my research assistant on my book and subsequently wrote his own Trump Nation, uh, and he is now at Bloomberg. He's the editor of the opinion section of uh, Bloomberg Media. And uh, he has seen the tax returns. Now, he hasn't seen them for the most recent year, but he saw them for a number of years. Uh, Donald Trump sued him over his book, 
uh, you know, it was sort of when, when my book came out, he, he publicly threatened to sue me, but he never did. Now, I named 25 mob associates of Donald Trump or whatever, and that doesn't motivate him to sue. But if you say he's not worth what you what he claims to be worth, that's what Tim he sued Tim because Tim said he was only worth 200, 300 million. Now, Tim was a business editor at the Times. He was a young guy, just got an MBA from Columbia when he was my assistant, but he has an incredible business head. And uh, so uh, he sued Tim over that. The litigation went on for six or seven years, and Tim prevailed. But during the course of the litigation, Tim's lawyers demanded that Donald make the, tr the tax returns available. And they did for a number of years. And uh, so Tim signed a confidentiality agreement, so he can't specifically reveal what is in the tax returns. But he wrote a piece for Bloomberg very recently that said Donald's not releasing his tax returns because the income will be far less than he claims it is. The assets will be worth far less than what he says it is. And his charitable contributions are virtually non-existent. So those are the three primary reasons why he won't release these returns. Uh, you know, he has made a career. When I say I don't know why he's never been prosecuted, maybe the prime time that he could have been prosecuted was at the time of his downfall uh, in 1990 and 91. Well, you know, the banks kept him alive as he was too big to fail, so they kept him alive. But I wrote in the book, he certainly didn't sue when I said it, I didn't say that he'd made, submitted false financial statements to the bankers to get a billion dollars in personally guaranteed loans. I submit, said he submitted fraudulent ones, right? And I lay out the case for that in the book. He was engaged in completely defrauding the banks, and the banks knew it, okay? And they were giving him the loans anyway. So they kept him alive, but even more so than that, the House Banking Committee wanted to do public hearings about it. The banks wouldn't cooperate. The district attorney of Manhattan was a big friend of Donald's. Donald's was his second biggest giver. Robert Morgenthau's second biggest giver was Donald Trump. Donald was the chairman of the Police Athletic Com League, which was Morgenthau's biggest charity. So he was extremely close. He hired Andy Maloney, who was the U.S. attorney in the Eastern District. He hired Maloney's brother, right? Uh, Rudy Giuliani was the U.S. attorney in Manhattan, and we know how close they got. I wrote a whole story about how their relationship developed. I was at uh, Rudy Giuliani's first fundraiser when he decided to run for mayor, and there's Donald at the main table. He's the co-chair of the first Rudy Giuliani uh, fundraiser for the mayorality in 1989. So his relationships with prosecutors and the fact that the bankers, they were embarrassed by what they had done. They didn't want any investigation of this. So the combination of the two uh, gave, gave them a pass, gave them a pass. You talk about his relationship with prosecutors. Uh, Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey, formerly a prosecutor, what about this close alliance as so many Republicans are running away from Trump? Chris Christie has wrapped himself around Trump. Yeah, I don't think Chris Christie, you know, he's had, uh, Donald has had extraordinary relationships when he was the power in Atlantic City with a series of governors, and it didn't matter which party. I mean, he had incredibly close relationship with Tom Kane. But remember his, you know, his political advisor all these years has been Roger Stone, who ran Tom Kane's campaign uh, for governor the first time down in Jersey. And so he's always had an in. Roger's always had a special relationship with Jersey politicians. I don't know if he has one with Chris Christie. I frankly don't know. But he has a long history of that. And so Roger Stone, who is really the walking, living son of Roy Cohn, I mean, absolutely raised by Roy Cohn, lived in the town or spent a great deal of time in the townhouse that Roy Cohn ran the law firm out of. And uh, so, but as to Christie, 
and Donald, it sort of has surprised me. I, I can't really quite figure out why this embrace. I mean, I think the ultimate thing, since he's already said Christie will be his chief of staff, I'm predicting that Rudy will be his vice presidential candidate. And so then, between the three of them, you know, we'll have this, you know, maybe Newt figures in there somewhere. I don't know. But, you know, Newt, Rudy, Rudy, he's already said he's going to be in charge of Homeland Security. This is a, a group. I, the relationship with Rudy is deep and very disturbing. Let me ask you. It, to Pull back a little bit for the big picture. I mean, this is a sordid story of somebody who's been buying politicians, been involved with uh, the worst criminal elements uh, in, in American society, uh, at the same time, uh, a crony capitalism of the worst sort. Why do you think he's been able to gather so much support uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the public imagination. You, you say at one point in your introduction, everyone, this is when Trump was announcing uh, for president, everyone else in the movie that Donald is making with his life that morning and beyond is just an extra. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's the thing that maybe disturbs me the most uh, about the media coverage of him, particularly television is to call him a populist. You know, we're now saying that what just happened in Britain was supposedly a populist expression. Well, the whole history of populism is against elites. You know, and what's driving the Trump campaign and what I think drove the Brexit vote is not animosity towards elites. That may be a small part of it, but what's really driving it is, is antagonism towards immigrants mostly minorities. That's what's driving the Trump campaign. I, I thought it was um, pretty remarkable when you will listen to the, the Dana Bashes and the, uh, uh, the other commentators on CNN, one election after another, when he carried all but Texas of the old Confederacy, and they would one night after another say, isn't it remarkable? that a kid from Queens is winning in Alabama? And instead of offering the logical explanation for it, which is that it's naked racism that he is appealing to, they instead say it's the thirst for an outsider. It's, it's what's driving this is the thirst for an outsider, when at the same day, they renominated Richard Shelby, who actually had a right-wing opponent and who was the chair of banking in the Senate and who was getting all of his money from Goldman Sachs and every other house, you know, contributing to him. He's, uh, he's an embodiment of the insider. And they nominated him overwhelmingly, so he didn't even face a runoff. There were two candidates running against him. Uh, they, so these people who were attracted by an outsider were apparently simultaneously attracted by the ultimate insider. Well, what explains that? I mean, I think it is so clear that race is the driving motive of this campaign, the driving cause for its success, uh, the scapegoating of everybody who's not a white male. Is what's is what's driving this this candidacy, and it's it's led to its success so far. Whether or not there's enough of that to elect him president, I mean, this still is the same country that elected Barack Obama twice, and after four years of experience with him, re-elected him in 2012. It's not a dramatically different country than it was in 2012. So I got to believe that there are limits to this race card. But that's the, the only explanation to me for going from one unbelievably uh, manipulative, contrived, false statement after another, attacking a judge. I actually think that attacking the judge may have been not a mistake on his part, but something very consciously done to say, look, even a big guy like me, they're screwing with even me, these Mexicans. Uh, you know, uh, look, I know what you've got. I know you got a problem back there, but they can even take me on, you know? And um, so I think that race is 
the absolute undercurrent of this. It shouldn't be an undercurrent. For a brief period of time there, when the Mexican judge thing appeared, the television media seemed to be willing to talk about race. I think, you know, we're seeing that change again. Uh, you know, but they have to keep this, television people have to keep this thing alive. Yeah. If she's ahead by 13 points, how many millions do they lose? Wayne Barrett is an investigative reporter. He worked with The Village Voice for 37 years. His biography of Donald Trump has just been republished as an e-book. It's called Trump, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Deals, The Downfall, The Reinvention. We'll be back with Wayne Barrett in a minute. It's Old Man Trump by Ryan Harvey and Andy DeFranco and Tom Morello, the song written but never recorded by Woody Guthrie about his landlord, Donald Trump's father, Fred Trump. Our first break was another Woody Guthrie song. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We conclude our conversation with Trump biographer Wayne Barrett, who's tracked the Republican presumptive presidential nominee for decades. His biography of Trump has been republished as an e-book. It's called Trump, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Deals, The Downfall, The Reinvention. Juan Gonzalez and I interviewed him last week at his home in Brooklyn, I asked Wayne about those harmed by Trump's business practices, from the Polish workers who built Trump Tower to the investors in the casino he never built in Mexico. His pathway to success is littered with bodies. You know, I, 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 I hear him talk about the thousands of Latinos he's employed. I, you know, I don't know what he's talking about. I'm sure, Juan, you're aware there are almost no Latinos in Atlantic City. You couldn't employ Latinos in Atlantic City. It's, it's, there's a lot of black people there, but it has no significant Latino population. I was in and out of his casinos all the time. I never saw many Latino workers. I don't know where these thousands of Latinos that are supposedly worked for him have worked for him, but it wouldn't be Atlantic City, and I don't know where else he ever employed thousands of people. Uh, and, uh, and certainly the Taj, for example, just talk about the Taj, which was, at the time, you know, this is, he had this incredible downfall where his personal life this is when he dumps his wife and children and goes with Marla at the same time when he was on this fast track, 87, 88, 88 was the disaster year, that, you know, where he... He makes one bad judgment after another, so he is trying to get the city of New York, Ed Koch, to support the building of the tallest skyscraper in the history of the country on the West Side Yards for NBC headquarters. And at the same time, he takes on the Taj, which will be the largest casino in the history of the world. So he doesn't get the approvals from Koch. So he doesn't build the, uh, the NBC tower on the West Side, but he goes ahead and tries to build the Taj. And he so over-leverages everything, junk bonds, adding to cost all over the place. Just one bauble after another, it was just—so it was doomed from the day it opened. It could never make the payments. It, it could never make the bond payments. And so they stiffed all the bondholders, but they also stiffed all the small contractors. In Atlantic City, you know, guys, you know, mom and pop shops who did all the work there. I used to walk through it while it was under construction. And the place was just filled with contractors. I talked to many of them, and they didn't know they were all going to get stiffed in the end, but they got 20 cents, 30 cents on the dollar or nothing. And he just stiffed so many of them. So small businesses went out of business. What about the Polish workers at Trump Tower? The Polish workers at Trump Tower became a, a kind of famous case. Uh, and um, the, the, the Bonwit Teller building was part of the site. 
And this, you know, when you look at that site, this is the genius of Donald Trump, how he managed to assemble that site. It's, you know, I don't think he can find a better site in America, maybe in the world, than the location that he had. So that was part of his genius at the time, was assembling these kinds of sites and making these acquisitions. But he was completely unconcerned about the workers who worked uh, in the demolition of the Bonwit Teller building, uh, who literally slept there. And they were all immigrant Polish workers, hundreds of them, many of whom got very sick as a result of working on that site. He's always tried to put some distance between. But his office was right across the street. His office was, you know, with how he could claim that he didn't know what was going on in that site, which has been his claim. And there's no question but that these workers were abused to an enormous degree. Wayne Barrett, we wanted to ask you about Donald Trump's wives. Um, he's married three people, um, Ivana Trump, uh, uh, Marla Maples, and Melania Trump. Um, they factor in significantly um, in his campaign. Ivana Trump actually accused him of raping her. Can you talk about the significance, especially as he moves into attacking Bill Clinton, um, not because of Bill Clinton's behavior with his wife, per se, but with, uh, with other women? It's a real irony that, uh, uh, you know, that he has the balls to do this. Um, you know, we, I watch the children in these shows, and they're given remarkable deference by television journalists. I mean, they treat him as if they're Heidi Cruz's kids. You know, they don't ask him, oh, do you love your papa? That seems to be the only question that they can ask him. But, and he appears to be a good father. But if you're a good father, OK, you're going to go through a divorce. A lot of good fathers and mothers have gone through divorces. They don't leak best sex I ever had stories to be plastered all over the tabloids while their 13-year-old son is going to school. Explain what you mean. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, Donald milked the divorce, the breakup with part of his shtick. One of the reasons white males love him so much in this campaign is they think he's a stud, right? I mean, Marla Maples was a beauty, classic American beauty, you know? So... The whole thing that he fed during that divorce, which was— His divorce with— With Ivana, yes, was just so incredibly ugly. And it was damaging to the children. And then he got into a fight with Ivana over who gets what in the end. And, like, he wanted Eric's computer. They fought over Eric's computer, Is right? That... Yes, I mean, and, and so— his treatment of Ivana, the mother of his first three children, was just deplorable. And then Marla already has the child before they get married, right? And so when he breaks up with her, she signs a confidentiality agreement. So, you know, the two of them, their lips are sealed. But when she thought he was running for president in 2011, she was doing an interview in, in Britain, in London. And she said, if he runs for president, I'm going to have to tell the world what he's really like. And the lawyers, Trump's lawyers, go immediately into court. And then they actually stood out after they got some sort of a order from the court, and she's completely silenced, and we'll never hear from her again. You know, they actually stood in front of the courthouse and said she had proven that she was a bimbo. That's what they said. So, I, I mean, the, the, the way in which he has treated his wives is just, it, it's, it, it's really deplorable. Uh, I wrote in the book that uh, Donald took uh, the Fifth Amendment a hundred times uh, during the course of the divorce proceedings in his deposition, uh, questioned by Ivana's lawyers about other women. And the Division of Gaming Enforcement down in New Jersey reviewed my book. And they actually got his deposition, which I didn't have. I had an estimate that came from a very knowledgeable source. 
And so I said 100, and they corrected me and said, no, we only took the Fifth Amendment 97 times. Keep that in mind when you hear from Donald Trump about the deposition that Bill Clinton did about Paula Jones, yeah, which was the basis of the impeachment. And uh, so here's Donald apparently not committing perjury, but refusing to answer 97 questions about other women, which I think says an awful lot about his, uh, his marital life. So, Wayne, you've been doing this work for decades, um, and here you are, um, after following Donald Trump for almost half a century, publishing a book again, a, a revised and updated book on Donald Trump. What keeps you going? Uh, Donald does these days. I've been very sick, and um, so I decided when he started emerging, which was a total surprise to me, really, that he would be this big. Um, so I've opened my door here. I've had 50, 60 reporters come through here. I kept all my old Trump files. Most of them are in this basement. Some of them are down in the house in Ocean City. And reporters have come through. Here's one team of two spent three days in my basement. And uh, so I've been an open door to every reporter. I haven't written much myself, one little piece, but uh, I intend to write some. And, you know, I think it's a civic duty. Why? Well, it, he's not... It's, it's, it's more than that he's something unlike anything. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm a Democrat. I'm a liberal Democrat. Uh, I have voted in my life for candidates on the Republican line. Uh, not often, but sometimes. But I think that this is a man uh, uh, who is, he's really uh, not qualified to run, run the Trump organization. He's not fit to run the Trump organization. So he's certainly not fit to run America. Uh, the Trump organization is a fairly substantial uh, real estate company, certainly not one of the biggest in Manhattan, as the Times demonstrated. But it's, you know, it has some impact on some lives. And he's so unconcerned about the impact that he has on some lives, whether there's any positive element to it, that I don't even think he's fit for that. But I think he represents not just a danger to America, but because we are such an influence in the world. It's really a shocking threat to the world. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm in a sick bed a lot, but he gets me up out of it. Wayne Barrett, an investigative reporter who worked at The Village Voice for 37 years and continues to report. Juan Gonzalez and I spoke to him last week at his home, where he's largely been confined due to his battle with lung cancer. Wayne Barrett's biography of Trump was just republished as an e-book. It's titled, Trump, the Greatest Show on Earth, The Deals, the Downfall, the Reinvention. Visit our website at democracynow.org to watch, listen to, or read part one of our interview with Wayne Barrett that we ran last week. We have several job openings, a news producer and a senior video news producer, as well as an office coordinator. They're all full-time jobs based here in New York City. Find out more at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Laura Gottesdiener, Dina Guster, Sam Alcoff, Robbie Karen, Hani Masood, Trina Nandura, Juan Carlos Davila, and Pedro Rodriguez, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Naguera, and Paul Huckabee are our engineers. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Julie Crosby, Hugh Grant, David Prove, Ariel Boone, Vesta Godars. I'm Amy Goodman. Again, our website is democracynow.org. Thanks for joining us.